Chapter 9 of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts Since he had first come to ours, Father Vianney had never had a day, or even half a day, that was his own to do with as he liked. Now the pressure was much greater. He would go to church at one in the morning, or even at midnight, and hear confessions until Mass at six or seven o'clock the next morning. Always awaiting him were long lines of people who had stood outside the church since the previous evening. After Mass, he would return to the confessional until eleven o'clock, when he held his catechism class. At first, the class had been for the children, both those who lived at Providence and those who came from the village and nearby farms. But adults, hearing of the helpful instructions the cure gave, crowded around windows and doors trying to catch his words. We will move the class to the church, where all can be seated, Father Vianney decided. But it was not long before the seats were all filled and people stood in the aisles and on the porch, and still there was not room. In the afternoon he was once again in the confessional, where he stayed until it was time for the rosary and benediction which closed the day. At nine, as a rule, he went home, with his office still to be read. The crowds grew larger, sixty, seventy, a hundred people a day, then two hundred, three hundred, four hundred. Five horse-drawn bus lines were now serving ours. The parish reached only by a cart track when Father Vianney became its curie. The railroad, which stopped at the station of a nearby town, extended round-trip tickets to a week. This was because people often had to wait three or four days before their turn came to make their confessions to the curie of ours. The four hotels were always filled, private homes were opened, and through the summer farmers set aside special fields in which the pilgrims might sleep. Ours, which had drawn small crowds of noisy, drunken revelers in the old days, now drew vast armies of quiet, intent, and prayerful people. Sick people were cured at St. Philomena's Shrine. Suffering minds were eased by the curie. Diseased souls were made well again. Just to talk to him, the pilgrims would say, if I can just talk to him, I know everything will be better for me. But to talk to him required hours of patient waiting. Day after day, week after week, month after month, Father Vianney heard the recital of the people's sins, reprimanded and advised the penitents. Of course, not all who came were sinners. There were the pious and good, too, who wanted counsel and direction for the betterment of their lives. One such, going into the sacristy where the curie sometimes spoke with the people, saw a beautiful lady in blue talking to the priest. He had come upon the curie of ours, getting help and wisdom from the Mother of God herself. In 1835, Father Vianney was making preparations to go away on his own concerns. As he bustled about checking on various details before leaving, his hair, snowy white, although he was only forty-one, blew in the wind, and his cassock flapped around his hurrying legs. He had hoped for a long time to be able to make a retreat, and now he was arranging for a few days at his old seminary, where a group of his confreres were going for a time of spiritual reinvigoration. Before he could leave, of course, there were innumerable things to be done. He was happy in the thought that he would soon be having a few hours of recollection of the solitude which had been denied him for so long. He wanted help in deciding whether it was conscience or the devil, which constantly whispered in his ear, You are no good as a priest. You are falling in your tasks. You should resign from your parish and leave it to a priest who can really do the work. Torn as he always was, and would be to the end of his days, between his duty to God and his duty to man, the curie had decided that the people of ours could wait while he got the help he felt he needed. Monsignor Devi, who was in charge of the seminary, knew the sanctity of the curie, knew of the immense and needed work for souls that he was doing, work the curie could never properly evaluate himself because of his saintly humility. You do not need a retreat, Monsignor Devi said firmly. The people of ours and those who come to ours need you very badly, and I repeat, you do not need to be here. You are to go back, and now. Slowly and sadly, before the retreat had even begun, the curie went back to his parish, back to the thousands of people who wanted his decisions and advice, to the long days and nights in the confessional. Again the days and weeks and months went by, and as they grew into years, an idea became more firmly fixed in Father Vianney's mind. Anyone, he felt in his humility, could do the work he was doing, to save his own soul, he was certain, he should live out the rest of his life in a monastery where he could spend his hours in prayer and meditation, making himself a better priest than he believed himself to be. He asked Monsignor Devi for permission to make the move, but was refused. 
He prayed very hard and asked again. Again he was refused. He pondered the two great commandments and trembled with fear that in obeying the second, love of neighbor, he was slighting the first, love of God. He was torn between his duty as parish priest and his desire for a life of prayer and penance, for he saw himself as a miserable sinner. God wants every man to save his soul, he told himself. I have been here a long time, but I do not feel as if I were making any progress on my own road to heaven, so I will leave and go to a monastery. These thoughts came only from the curious humility in his deep love of God, but the devil seemed to think differently. He seemed to think he had won. There were none of the rappings and bangings in the curie's little house that night. Everything was quiet and the world was at rest. All the world, that is, except Father Vianney. He was excited, half a little boy running away from home and half a man who had come to a grave decision and was going to act on it. His breviary, his rosary, and a few books of spiritual reading were packed in a small bundle with his clothing. He went quietly out of the house and under the dark high dome of the sky. He walked down the lonely road. It chanced that he had finished hearing the confessions of all the waiting pilgrims that day, and the line had not formed outside the church in readiness for him to appear the next day, so there was no one to see his escape. He walked along the road, drawing clear air deep into his lungs, looking at the far-off stars and thinking of the Creator who hung them there and kept them in their courses. A trial near the crossroads reminded him of the holy child's first crib. The stark arms of a dead tree, spread wide against the night glow, brought a sob from his throat as he thought of the God-man's last torturing bed. He fingered the rosary in his pocket, asking Christ's mother to bless him on his journey. His heart leaped in joy as he thought of days and nights when he could spend uninterrupted hours in prayer and contemplation. Then he could praise God and serve Him, could be sorry for his sins and the sins of the world. The sins of the world! As he looked around the fields now, he was aware of people sleeping on the ground. They were pilgrims on their way to ours. Suppose there was one among them who was a real sinner, who had had to wrestle with himself to get this far, and if he went to ours the next day, only to find that the man on whose help he counted was gone, he might well turn away and go back to his evil ways. The curie kept walking, but his step was slower. A soft night breeze brushed down his face. Far off on some tree-hidden farm, a dog barked at the moon, which had just come above the horizon. Father Vianney smiled at this echo of a timeless feud. Then his face sobered again, as his mind went back to the rightness and justice of his escape from his parish. Father, my husband died, and I am penniless. Father, the boys in my village say... Father, I can't seem to pray, and... The voices seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere. Voices of the pilgrims who traveled long miles to see and talk with and listen to the curie of ours. Then he seemed to hear another voice asking him a question. Hasn't God called you to serve him as the parish priest of ours? A groan came from Father Vianney's throat. He knew the answer but did not want to admit it. He thought of the quiet, the lovely order of days in the monastery, he could pray there, he could praise God and adore Him. For a moment he stood in the sweet dark, the soft air. Then, sadly, determinedly, he turned around and trudged back to ours. The crowd when he reached there had begun to form outside the church. Father Vianney slipped quietly into his house. When he went out to the confessional an hour or two later to start his eighteen-hour day, his serene, loving face gave no clue to the battle he had fought and won that night. Patient, gentle, stern when need be, he listened, and he said to each one just what that person needed to hear. One May evening, three years later, he collapsed while speaking in the pulpit. He had driven himself unmercifully, for years, had demanded from his frail body work that would have killed a giant. Now he had little reserve energy with which to fight the pneumonia which set in. For nine days he hung suspended between life and death between the heaven he longed for and the earth which gave him such a heavy task to fulfill. Then, while a priest's friend was saying the Mass of St. Philomena for the curie's recovery, he turned the corner and was out of danger. But his recovery was long and hard, made harder because once again the longing for the silence and order of the cloister swept over him. The Viscount of Ars, who had been his friend for many years, came to call one day. He found the curie sitting up in bed, his eyes filled with tears. The nobleman was frightened. What is the matter? Are you in pain? I will call. 
No, don't call anyone. The curie was weak but decided. It is just that I am longing for solitude. All my life, it seems, I have longed for solitude, and I have never had it. But as he grew a little stronger, he decided that he would have it. Forgetting his decision of three years ago, he determined to be rid of the weight of other people's problems and free to devote himself to prayer and penance. The vicar general urged him to take the two weeks vacation allowed to every priest in the diocese, to take longer if that was necessary to build up his strength again. A curate had come to share the work. The curie listened and planned, but told no one of his decision. Now was his chance, he told himself, to leave ours and the work which he was sure he was not doing well. In September, when he felt he had enough strength for walking, he once again stole out of his house in the darkness, carrying the little bundle of his worldly possessions. He planned to go to Lyons and seek refuge in a monastery there. He had not gone far when he heard footsteps behind him. It is someone following me, Father Vianney decided, someone who will want me to go back. But I won't. The bishop has sent me a curate, and a young, strong man can do better work than I. I'll hurry a little. But the footsteps behind him speeded up, too, and several voices spoke in the dark. Father Vianney, I need to consult you. Father Vianney, will you bless this rosary? Father Vianney, will you advise me? The curie ignored them, walking along as rapidly as he could, determined on getting to the heaven he longed for. The pilgrims followed a little longer, and then began dropping back, unsure of how to act in this unexpected situation. One young man stayed with the curie, suspecting his plans, but anxious to serve. I am not asking you to stay, Father Vianney, but let me go with you to carry your bundle. That is all I ask. They walked through the night, saying the rosary together. Then thin dawn came, lighting the highway. Father Vianney was disturbed. If we keep to the road, we will surely meet carriages bringing people to ours, he said to his companion, and pilgrims on foot use this road, too. They may recognize me. The young man agreed that they undoubtedly would. Then we must cut across country. We'll go through these woods. They'll bring us out to a lane leading to a back road. Walking on the highway taxed the strength of the priest, who had not yet fully recovered from his illness, but the route he now took in his flight was hard even for his young companion. Briars caught at their clothing, and branches raked their faces and hands. They slipped unwarily into holes covered by the carpet of leaves on the ground. Sharp roots cut first one of Father Vianney's shoes, and then the other, but he trudged on. He was away from ours now, and would continue his journey. The sun climbed the heavens, seemed to pause overhead for a moment, then began its descent. The curie was moving even more slowly now, but still he kept walking. It was dark when they reached Dardily, the town of Father Vianney's birth. Why, this is only twenty miles from ours, the young man said to himself. I could have come here and back in the eighteen hours we have been walking. He looked at the frail man beside him. The priest's feet were torn and bleeding, and his breath came in painful, tearing gasps. It did not seem possible that the thin, almost emaciated body could be forced to go farther. And now, Father Vianney, he asked, my brother Fenkos, his home is near. I will go there and rest a little before I continue on my way to Lyons. You rest a little, too, before you go back to ours. We have come a long way, and thank you for accompanying me. The curie needed more than a little rest. Sick and utterly exhausted, he was at once put to bed. His companion went back to ours, and ours filled with consternation at the loss of its saint. It was on the 12th of September that Father Vianney left ours. On the 13th, a letter arrived from the countess in the chateau outside the village, asking if there was anything she could do that would convince him he should return. On the 14th, the mayor of ours rode to Dudderley, and at Frankel's home asked to be shown into the little first-floor room where he had been told the curie lay. He is not there, Frankel's wife said. Gone again? the mayor exclaimed. May I write a note to leave for him, in case he returns? Mrs. Vianney nodded permission, not explaining that she had simply moved her exhausted brother-in-law upstairs, where he might be undisturbed. I need not tell you, my dear curie, all the sorrow I feel at not finding you here, the letter began. I came with a great desire to see you and to get your blessing once more. He continued, reminding the curie of how much good Providence was doing, and of how completely it depended on Father Vianney's guidance for its operation. He spoke of the holy souls which you are guiding to heaven, and of those who were far off whom you are leading home. 
You need rest, the letter went on, as no one knows better than I. Stay with your brother as long as is necessary for you, but do not forget your poor parish of ours. He left the letter to be delivered. It was followed shortly by one from a hotel keeper in ours, who in the old days had owned one of the crude taverns. Father Vianney, the man wrote, I hasten to implore you not to desert us. You know what I have said, and I repeat it now from the bottom of my heart. If there is anything which you disapprove of in my house, I would change it according to your wishes. On the 16th of September, Father Raymond, who had been the curious assistant in ours, went to the bishop to ask what he should do. Receiving instructions, he proceeded on to Dardilly. He found the streets filled with pilgrims who had learned where Father Vianney was and had left ours to seek him out. Father Raymond reported the bishop's directions to Father Vianney. He was not to stay in Dardilly because it was not his own diocese. However, if he really felt he must leave ours, there were two other parishes to which he might go. Come, Father Vianney, said Father Raymond. Suppose we go and look at the places you are offered. Yes, I'd better leave here anyway, agreed the curie. These crowds are making life quite difficult for my brother and his wife. Quietly and unobserved by the waiting crowd of pilgrims, the two priests slipped out of the house and began their walk to Beaumont, one of the places the bishop had mentioned. The curie was still far from strong, and as he went along he supported himself on a staff. Father Raymond was worried. It did not seem to him that the older priest could possibly make the trip afoot. Yet they put the miles behind them. When they came to a little town with the chapel, Father Raymond thought it would be a good place to rest. Instead of reading our office by the wayside, he suggested, let us stop here and do so. Father Vianney, his voice almost gone since his last illness, nodded. The two entered the chapel, went to one of the front pews, and knelt. Father Raymond finished reading first. He raised his head and looked about him and saw, to his amazement, that almost every seat in the church was filled. It was as if people had been summoned by a bell. Father, he whispered, all the people from miles around seem to have learned that you are here. I know that you have not the voice to speak to them, but at least give them your blessing. The curate closed his brief read and looked at the crowd. They had come to hear him speak, and, warrior in God's cause that he was, he would not disappoint them. I will speak to them, he said simply. He went to the front of the church and spoke, and though to the people nearest him his voice was weak, his words were understandable. Moreover, those in the back of the church heard him equally well. The curie finished his talk, gave the congregation his blessing, and the two priests started off again. They reached Beaumont that night. The next morning, each said his mass and made his thanksgiving. As they rose from their knees, the curie leaned toward Father Raymond to whisper in his ear, Let us return to ours, he said. End of chapter 9 Recording by Maria Therese